Hi, Professor. See you, Sarah. Have a good weekend. You too. Dr. Train, will I bother you for sure. a while? Okay. I'm just a little confused on 
um, or oh, oh, part of the model. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. sorry. One moment. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I like just recently changed my password. <laughs> Oh, wait, I think I know what the problem is. I'll ask you after class. Okay. Sounds <laughs> sweet. <laughs> I think it's because I changed my password. Yeah. And I think it's trying to connect to Edu Room with my old password. Uh, and that's why it's not letting me log in. Oh, that's annoying. I'll ask you. I chose to go past and because I got there. Um, yeah, but I can't use one. The software is not. It's not All right, it's uh, four o'clock. Let's go and get started. Great, uh, great crowd today. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's uh, how's everyone doing today? Hope you're doing good, doing good. All right, so uh, um, so I know big thing probably everyone's um, thinking about projects due tomorrow. So make sure you guys are 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 working on that. Um, I am um, going to be busy all morning tomorrow. But if you did have last minute questions about the project, I am. Um, going to be available mostly in the afternoon. So if you want to send me an email tomorrow, if you're having uh, some last minute issues, um, you know, I can, we can also, you know, meet up on zoom tomorrow too. If you want me to take a look at your model, uh, we can do that as well, but, you know, make sure, make sure you get the project in on time. Uh, cause next week we're going to be working on the next part, which is uh, going to be your final project. So that's meshing simulation and, uh, analysis. And so, um, you want, you definitely want to make sure you have your model done, uh, before then. Okay. Um, so the plan for today um, is to continue with our set of lecture notes that we started on Tuesday. So we're talking about velocity distributions in blood vessels, uh, mostly unsteady um, velocity distributions. And so we'll continue on with that. I think we should probably finish up those lecture notes today. Um, and then we'll go from there. And so the reason, uh, and so we'll talk about this more in depth later today, but the reason I want to do this particular topic before we went to CFD is that there is going to be a part of uh, when you run your simulation where you can specify the uh, velocity profile distribution. And so I want to make sure that you kind of understand your options for that. So uh, once we kind of finish with this, then we're, 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 we'll be in a pretty good place in terms of, uh, you know, getting ready to actually run the simulation. And so uh, next week, we'll, we'll kind of introduce the, uh, the idea of computational fluid dynamics uh, in general. Uh, and then we'll talk about kind of the more specific things that are required for blood flow simulations. Part of that is the velocity distribution. Okay. All right. Um, so another announcement. So we'll we'll definitely talk about this more next week as well. Is that we do have a, a midterm exam. Um, it's not going to be next week, but it's going to be the week after that. Okay. 
Um, so uh, we'll, uh, next week, what I'll do is I'll put out a study guide for you to uh, to be able to study for the midterm exam. Um, but, uh, but just kind of keep that in mind. So I think right now what I'm planning for for the midterm exam is going to be two weeks from today. Uh, so not next Thursday, but the following Thursday after that. So we'll we'll kind of we'll finish out week fourteen with the edit. Okay. Uh, all right, and so uh, so that's all my announcements for today. Uh, any questions I can answer before we get started? Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to scroll up a little bit just so you can kind of see where we left off. Okay. So actually, let me let me give some context. So you know the the whole the whole idea with this section is to um, you know come up with a mathematical expression for the velocity distribution. Um, when your flow is awesome, when your flow is, is pulse time. Okay, so we're talking about the velocity distribution in unsteady and particular pulsatile conditions, right? And so if we were to draw a vessel, kind of a typical kind of two-dimensional vessel where the blood flow is going from left to right, right? What we're interested in is, you know, what is the uh, distribution of velocity within the vessel, right? And so whenever you have flow inside a vessel, you have the uh, velocity distribution like this, So this is typically uz is a function of r, okay? Remember, the way that we obtained this result, the way that we obtained our velocity distribution is through the solution of our Navier-Stokes equations, okay? which as you know, is, is very difficult to do. And we can only really do it in, in certain select situations. Um, so probably what, you, what you've all done in the past is you've, you've solved Navier-Stokes under steady conditions. And so what that does is that it, it basically eliminates the time variable. Um, so what we're doing in, 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 uh, in this section is, you know, if we were to reintroduce the time variable, so our velocity distribution is not only a function of R, but also a function of time, how does that affect our velocity distribution? Um, so what I have shown there is, is kind of the very classical velocity distribution. So that's known as Poiseuille flow uh, or Poiseuille flow, depends on how French you are, I guess. Um, but when you when you introduce kind of this time variable, it, it does change the shape. And that's kind of what we're interested in. Okay. So what we did last time and, and, and what we spent kind of the majority of the time doing is that if we if we took our Navier-Stokes and we solved our Navier-Stokes, um, you know, with the time with the time variable, we ended up with this solution here, okay? Where the spatial part of our velocity distribution depends on these things called the vessel functions, right? So vessel function of the first kind and vessel function of the second kind where, uh, where their distributions are like this, okay? So the next step in this process is to take, take our current solution, what we have here for the velocity distribution and apply boundary conditions, right? And so that's what we're going to do today. So we're going to take our C1, we're going to take our boundary conditions and use those to solve for our, our, our coefficient C1 and C2. Okay. So last time we have y of x is equal to C1 and j0 of x plus C2 uh, y0 of x. Okay. 
And if you remember from last time, you know, the reason we have y and x here is that these are our change of variable variables. We didn't just all of a sudden switch to Cartesian coordinates. We're still we're still in cylindrical coordinates. It's just we use these y and x variables uh, just to make our equation a little bit more convenient to, to work with. But we, we are going to eventually convert back to u, z, and r. Okay, and just for now we're using it for that. Okay, so what are our boundary conditions? And so let's let's talk about our the typical boundary conditions that we um, um that we solve for. Okay. So the first boundary condition is it's not really a boundary condition, it, it's more just a, a physical, a physical limitation, is that when we apply um when we apply r is equal to zero, we should get a finite amount of velocity. And the main reason because r is equal to zero is, is part of our domain. Because okay. when you have a typical tube of, of, of fluid, whether it be a blood vessel or a pipe, you know, that pipe typically is, is completely full. So there's no kind of inner radius, outer radius, things like that. So, you know, we have flow kind of filling up the entire portion of the, of the vessel. And so that means we should get a mathematically feasible solution when we plug in R is equal to zero. Right? Sounds very straightforward, but you know this actually this actually does place a limitation on our result because if you look back at our plots for our two Bessel functions, right? So we have uh, j zero and y zero. Okay. In particular, what you should notice is that y zero, our Bessel function of the second kind, is undefined when x is equal to zero. And X is nothing more than just a surrogate for the uh, for the radius, right? And so in order for us to get a valid solution, right? In order for us to get a valid solution, that means Y zero cannot exist in our solution, right? Because if y0 was part of the solution, then when, whenever we plug in r is equal to zero, we get something that's undefined or minus infinity. And so what we can do right away, based on this kind of relatively simple condition, is we can set C, C2 is equal to zero. Okay. So that eliminates a whole term in our expression. So. Now our, our solution now is just going to be C1 times um, J0 of X. Okay. All right. So that's the first boundary condition and it, and it, and it simplifies our result tremendously. Okay. Our second boundary condition that we typically apply in these conditions is the no slip boundary condition uh, when you apply it at the vessel radius. Basically saying that when we plug in little r is equal to big R, then our velocity goes to zero, right? So one of the assumptions, of course, this, this, this is all um, kind of dependent on the assumption that we have rigid walls. And so we are making that assumption. Um, but you know, if you have rigid walls, that means we have zero velocity at the at the walls. Okay. okay. So let's go ahead and apply this condition. All right. But to apply this on our solution right now, we have to we have to go through our change of variable. Right. And so when we have uz at r is equal to r is equal to zero, okay. Remember, we made a change of variables that said y um, is equal to uz minus a 
over I omega rho. Okay. That was one of, that was the, the second change of variables that we did last time to simplify our result. Okay. And so when we plug in R is equal to zero, we plug in, we apply um, or excuse me, we apply uh, R is equal to big R. This means we have uz at r is equal to big R. Okay. Meanwhile, that second term, that minus a over um, i rho uh, omega, uh, that's just a constant, so that doesn't change. Okay. And so if we apply our boundary conditions, we say that the, the axial velocity at the wall is equal to zero. That means the boundary condition that we apply on y is that y of, as, uh, at little r is equal to big R is equal to minus a over i omega rho. Okay. okay. So let's go ahead and plug it in. Of course, you know, our, our function y here, our function y is not a function of r. Our function, r, our function y here is a function of x. And so we have to find out what the value of x is at r is equal to big R. So let's plug in a formula for x. So we know x is equal to i to three halves times little r times square root of omega over nu. Okay. And so we plug in big R into this, we get x is equal to i to three halves multiplied by big R square root omega over nu. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and plug all these things in. We have y, we evaluate it at x is equal to big R, i to the three halves, square root omega over nu. This is equal to minus a over i omega times rho. And this is equal to c1 times j0 at r, i to the three halves, square root of omega over e. So that right there is our boundary condition that we're going to apply, okay? So it's a little bit of a mess, and so it involves a Bessel function, and it involves a lot of these uh, properties, but it is it is an equation we can solve directly to C1. Okay. And so we solve for C1, what we get is C1 is equal to minus A times I divided by Rho omega J naught I to the three halves times R square root of omega over nu. <coughs> What's it? So now with that, we have both the values for C1 and C2. So we can plug this uh, back into our original velocity distribution and then uh, and get everything back. And so what we're gonna do from here is we're gonna basically apply, uh, first of all, plug in, plug in for this value for C1, and then we're going to undo all of the other change of variables, right? Uh, Cause we, we use this function Y, uh, we just use it as kind of like a crutch. Or not really a crutch, but just as a, just a convenient thing, you know, just to help us solve the equation. But ultimately, you know, what we want is a, a solution for u, z, right? So let's plug in. We're going to plug in for C1 and undo all the change of variables. To obtain. obtain our velocity distribution, uz. Okay, so it's going to be uz as a function of r and t. Okay. All right. 
Well, we'll go step by step. So we'll start with the function y. So first we have y of x is equal to minus ai all over rho omega k naught um, r i to the three halves square root of omega over nu multiplied by j naught i to the three halves times little r square root of omega over nu. So I guess I've already plugged in for x and so on. So we've we've kind of already we've kind of undone the x um, the x change of variables. Okay. Now let's undo the y change of variables. Okay. We know that uh, y is defined like this. So um, y is equal to uz minus a over i rho omega. Okay. And so if we solve this for uz, we see that uz is equal to y plus a over i omega rho. Okay. So we know what y is, right? Y is kind of that monstrosity that we just found up there. So let's go ahead and plug, uh, we'll plug all that in. Okay. Okay. So we plug that in, we get uz is equal to a over i rho omega multiplied by quantity one minus jo of i to three halves times little r square root of omega over nu divided by j naught i to three halves times big R squared with mega over nu, okay? One last thing that we'll add here, and so this is this is something that we that we did kind of very early in class on on last uh, Tuesday, was the uh, is the oscillating component. And so this entire thing right here, this is going to be multiplied by e to the i omega t. So remember this e to the i omega t, this is our time or our pulsatile component of our solution. So all that work we did with the Bessel functions and all that stuff, we were just solving for the spatial component. Um, but you know, we we solved for the spatial component. And now we're adding in the um, the time component as well. Okay. So now we have this kind of fully separable function, this fully separable solution that's a function of r and a function of t. Okay. So this is our full our full solution. All right. Any questions on on how we got to this uh, this point right here? All right, so all that all that was kind of the uh, um, the tedious stuff, but now now we can actually see this in action. Okay? Of course, you know this is this is not a function that you can plot by hand uh, unless you have photographic memory of what the Bessel function looks like, and even then it's it's kind of hard. Um, so this is something that you would have to plot in a software. Right? So um, so MATLAB of course has the uh, has the Bessel functions built in, um, and you can plot it for various for various values. All right. So next part is, you know, I, I want to kind of talk a little bit about how how this actually looks, right? 
And this is ultimately kind of the applicable part for you guys where, you know, you can, you can apply this next part to, uh, um, to the project, or at least you can kind of understand one, one setting of the project a little bit better. Okay. So now that we have the solution, we can, uh, let's, let's, let's play around with it. Okay. In particular, you know, I want to kind of see how the solution changes as you ramp up the frequency. So the frequency up to this point has kind of just been another variable, right? We haven't really done much with it in the solution. But if you look at our if you look at our full solution here, omega actually shows up in quite a few places. So we have one out here. We have some as part of the vessels functions, and we have um, the the frequency up there as well. Okay. The frequency is actually a very interesting part of this solution because it's a uh, it's it's almost like a it's almost like an indicator for heart rate. So multiple times throughout the day, you know, your heart rate can go up for various reasons. You know, when you're when you're exercising, you're working out, your heart rate goes up. Uh, but also if you're stressed or nervous about something, then that causes your heart rate to go up as well. Right. Um, this actually does change the nature of the flow inside inside your blood vessels. I mean, besides the fact that it's, it's you know, the reason your heart rate goes up is to push blood faster through. Uh, but it also changes the velocity distribution as well. OK. okay. So in particular. Let's look at it. Let's look at a couple situations. So let's look at a relatively slow frequency or, or a low frequency. Right? So these will be situations when maybe you're at rest or maybe you're just you're about to go to sleep, you're just waking up. And so in these situations, when your frequency is relatively low, um, then um, what you actually observe or what's, and what's been observed inside the cardiovascular system is that your flow rate or your velocity looks very parabolic. So let me go ahead and draw a couple of examples. Granted, the exact shape and size of the parabola are going to change throughout the uh, throughout the cardiac cycle, but it it basically maintains this uh, this parabolic thing. Remember, our parabolic velocity distribution looks something like this. Okay. Now, the 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 exact size of this parabola may change, and so you know you may come up to another part of the cardiovascular cycle where the parabola is a lot smaller. Okay. So the one on the left here, this might be what your velocity distribution looks like in systole. So systole is what happens when your heart is pumping. So right when your blood kind of, or right when your heart kind of ejects blood from your uh, from your heart, that's going to cause flow rates to to be really high. Okay, and so that's going to cause a velocity distribution that looks something like like that. Whereas in diastole, you know, if the uh, um, when the heart is relaxing. 
Um, then the flow rate is not so much. And so you're, you're the shy, the size of the parabola is going to go down, but it still basically tries to maintain that parab parabolic shape. Okay. But basically, you know, your velocity distribution is kind of fluctuating between big parabola, small parabola, big parabola, small parabola. Okay? And that's when your heart rate is relatively, relatively short. But question? Um, right. So when, when you're kind of at rest, you know, your, your flow is relatively well behaved in, and it almost kind of looks like a steady flow. Um, it's not exactly steady. It is, uh, it is still pulse, it is still pulsing, but, um, you know, it still kind of retains a lot of the same characteristics. Now let's contrast that. So let's uh, let's let's put a situation where the frequency is higher. Okay. So this would be a case when your omega is is getting bigger. And something actually very interesting happens in this regime. So I think the best, the best way to show you would just be to kind of visualize it. Okay. So while this, the smaller frequency cases, you have kind of very nice before parabolas, when the frequency gets higher, this kind of, this shape kind of starts to break down a little bit. So you may see something that looks like this. And so it, it almost looks like a parabola with, with kind of a dim. So in, in the end, you know, you still have a net forward uh, direction of flow, but that exact parabolic shape starts to break down and move, okay? And then, you know, it may progress into something like, like this. Where again, you kind of have this kind of depressed kind of a uh, parabolic form. Okay. All right. And so it, it kind of almost looks like, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's like trying to form the parabola. So you can see that it's, you know, maybe it's trying to form the rest of the parabola like this, you know, but there's, there's some factor that's kind of preventing it from, from forming that full parabola. So it's almost like kind of like you're inflating a balloon, right? So, so you know, you're inflating a balloon. It takes time for that to happen, right? And so if you were to stop kind of midway, right, um, then the balloon wouldn't fully be formed. And so that's, that's kind of the same thing here. Uh, and that analogy actually works pretty well because, you know, in these situations, you know, think mm -hmm. about it. Your, your frequency is high. And so because the, the oscillation frequency is higher, that means your forcing or your pressure gradient is also pulsing at a much higher frequency. Which makes sense, right? So if your heart rate is increasing, your heart is your heart is uh, your heart is being faster. That means the fluctuations in pressure are happening in your body much much faster than it was uh, before, right? Okay. And remember the relationship between pressure and velocity inside the cardiovascular system, right? 
So whenever the pressure changes, the velocity then has to respond to those changes in pressure. So it's not a, it's not a kind of a one to one correlation, right? So think about kind of a, think about an analogy from solid mechanics, right? Um, you know, when you apply force onto something, you know, it it depends on kind of the the, the properties of the material, how quickly that material will, will respond, right? So think about something that has a lot of um, that's that's very rigid. So maybe like a like a rock, right? And so if you push on a rock, you know, the entire rock is going to to move, right? Um, but you know, if you if you were to push or apply force onto a system that's a lot more flexible, um, maybe like say uh, I don't know, like a um, like a like a like a, like a mass of play doh or something like that, right? Um, and so if you push if you push on the play doh, right, and you release your hand, it takes time for the for the shape to kind of reform back to its its full its full shape, right? Just because some systems just kind of naturally it takes time. For them to kind of physically respond to any external stimuli. Okay. A lot of times we don't think about it in the classroom because, you know, we're just for simplicity, we think about um, steady case situations. But, you know, since we're since we're looking at kind of an unsteady situation, we have to think about kind of these um, this this time variable. OK, and so fluids is very much the same way. And so when you apply force, when you apply pressure to a fluid, it takes time for that to to kind of um, adjust to that uh, to that uh, to that response. And so if you have a situation where you're kind of rapidly changing the pressure, um, you know, direction and, and magnitude, then the inertia of the, of the fluid kind of prevents it from responding as quickly as those, as those changes. Another analogy that I like to make a lot is, is think about kind of a crowded hall of people, right? And so if you have kind of a hallway, right? And it's just filled with just a ton of, a ton of people, right? There's actually a lot of strong analogy to, between fluid mechanics and traffic, fluid mechanics and, and moving just a ton of people around, right? If you have like, you know, let's say that you have a sign, right? You have a signpost inside the uh, inside the corridor that says that you have to go this way. You have to go this way to to exit the building, right? You could have several signs, but you know, for all intents and purposes, we'll have just one sign up there, right? Because everyone is kind of all jumbled up together. You know, people. You know, there will be kind of a forward movement. People people will kind of push and kind of shove uh, each other to get to the exit, right? But it takes some time, right? Now think of a situation where you know you have this kind of steady flow of people going one way, but then all of a sudden you say uh, you change the sign. So instead of going to the right, you say, "All right, everyone, you know, let's change direction. Let's let's go to the left." Right? Think about if you were in that situation. Think about if you're in kind of a crowded hall of people. Trying all trying to get somewhere, and then all of a sudden you were you were forced to kind of turn around and go back, right? Do you think you would you'd be able to uh, to kind of turn around and and, and act uh, instantaneously? 
No, it would take time, right? Because, you know, we have people that already have some momentum going forward. Maybe not everyone saw the sign. And so, you know, people are still going that way. And so you're kind of trying to fight against uh, the flow, right? And so now it takes it takes time for everyone to reverse course and go the other way, okay? Now, imagine that happens at, at uh, a lot, right? So the, the, the direction of flow kind of changes a lot. And so, you know, eventually just gonna, you're just going to have chaos and people just not being able to move, okay? And so it's the exact same thing for fluids, right? And so when you, you know, the changing direction of, of the pressure gradient is exactly the same thing like this. So if I have, if we have our flow here, right? And it's not like our pressure gradient changes direction, right? And so, and so generally the pressure gradient is still all going one direction, but it's changing in magnitude a lot, right? So it's, you know, when the heart is, is pumping, it's saying everyone go fast. And when the heart's relaxes, everyone go slow. Go fast, go slow. Go fast, go slow. And so in those situations, you know, the velocity can't fully kind of uh, get to its, its fully developed shape. And so that's why you have kind of you know, situations that look like this. You have situations that look like this, right? So in general, you still have the... the uh, everyone's still going in the same direction. It's just that the exact shape kind of gets jumbled up a little bit, okay? And so this phenomenon where you have kind of these, these kind of in-between velocity profiles that can't quite keep up with the forcing, this is known as a warmer's lead velocity pitfall. And that solution that we that we came up with earlier there with the Bessel's functions and everything, that's known as the warmers least solution, right? So a lot of this work is, is credited to, um, you know, um, that guy warms it, okay? All right, any questions on, uh, any questions on that? Okay, all right. So it turns out, so, you know, we, we talked about, um, you know, the shape of the velocity profile as it changes with frequency, but it turns out there are other factors that you can, that you can affect to get the warmers we profile as well, okay? So there is a non-dimensional number called the warmers we number. That can be used to characterize the velocity distribution and what it would look like. Because your, your cardiovascular system kind of goes through different regimes. So sometimes your velocity profile looks uh, very much like a parabolic profile. So when, you're, when your heart rate is, is slow, then as your heart rate kind of speeds up, you know, it starts to, it starts to more look like a warmer's lead velocity profile. Okay. And so the warmer's lead number is kind of a way to, um, to kind of characterize that. So the warmer's lead number is defined as the following. Um, so if you, if you've taken a, a, a fluids class, you know, that fluid mechanics, people, they love their non-dimensional numbers. We have things like the Reynolds number. We have things like the fruit number, um, you know, things, things like that. Okay. So the warmers we number is, is, a, is very much one of those. You can tell that, you know, the person who made this theory was very much a fluid mechanics, uh, guy, right? Every, every, the dream for every fluid mechanics engineer is to have a, have a non-dimensional number named after yourself. Uh, just so you'll be immortalized in textbooks, I guess. So the warmers we number is defined uh, like the following. So it's usually defined as like warmers we number squared. Okay. So it's given the symbol alpha. 
and it's defined as the frequency multiplied by the radius of the vessel squared divided by the viscosity. And just like all non-dimensional numbers, it, it's uh, always a ratio of something. And so the ratio that is defined by the Wormersley number is on top, we have what's called transient inertial effects. And on the bottom there, we have viscous effects. Most fluid mechanical um, quantities are, are ratios of something and viscosity. Viscosity is kind of the, uh, um, you know, in, in a lot of fluid mechanics, it's kind of the thing that holds back a lot of up and down. All right, so notice where the frequency is. Frequency is, is up, on, up up top, right? And so this kind of tells us a little bit about the, um, the wormers we know. So if, if your wormers we number is, is relatively low, And so a low value of, of the Wormersley number would be somewhere around one or less than one. Okay. A Wormersley number of, of one basically means that your transient inertial effects are perfectly balanced with the risk with the viscous effects. Okay. And so when your Wormersley number is low, this tells you that um, you know um, the, uh, the the oscillation frequency is is kind of perfectly balanced. And so here you have uh, a parabolic velocity profile. The other case, of course, is if the warmers we number is high. Okay. So high warmers we number would be anything around, um, you know, um, anything around 10 or higher. And so in those situations, the viscous effect are the um, the uh, the oscillations or the pulse tile effects, those are going to be dominating. Okay. And so in those situations, you get a, a warmer's lead velocity profile, okay, where the uh, uh, where the velocity profile can't really keep up with the with the forcing. So that's kind of like the more strict kind of mathematical definition of kind of how these different profiles come about. Okay. So what we did before was we kind of talked about the physical reason why you get those different profiles. And, and then here's kind of a, a little bit of a, a metric that you can use to determine. All right. Any questions on, on this? Okay. So if we go back, if we go back to where we were, um, you know, all the figures that we drew before, right? So we come back here for the parabolic velocity profile. So this, another way you can say this is that, you know, instead of just a smoke frequency, kind of a more accurate or more broad way to state this is that this is um, cases when our warmers we number is low and my iPad is behind by five seconds or so. Yeah. Um, what about any cases where it's like between one and 10? Yeah. So of course there's uh, so I gave you the extremes here, um, one and, and 10, but there are definitely a lot of vessels where it's kind of in between those two. And so it's, um, you know, you'll probably get something kind of in between. So maybe not a full, a full on Wormersley profile, but not a full on parabola, but it's kind of something in between. It's, it's, it's a range between those two. All 
wow, it's really behind. <laughs> anyway, I'll just keep talking. All right. So um, while the Wormersley number is still on screen, right? Of course, you know, the one of the main determinants of the Wormersley number is the frequency. And now it decides to move. Almost there. All right. There we go. Okay, <laughs> we're all caught up. Okay, so uh, so you know what I was saying before is that you know we we drew these original parabolas, um, you know, for the cases when um, you know for slow frequency, right? And 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 that kind of made physical sense to us. But a more general way you can say this is that this is when the Wormersley number is low. So when your Wormersley number is low, you get um, parabolic velocity profiles like you do here. And then for higher frequencies, you have these kind of flat or kind of dimpled looking velocity profiles. This is when your Wormersley number is high. Okay, anyway. So now we know that you know the velocity, the exact shape of the velocity profile depends on the worms we know. Okay. Of course, you know we've we've only just been talking about frequency because uh, frequency is is a prominent uh, component to the Wormersley number. But you know, in order to non-dimensionalize that, you know, we have these other two factors as well. We have the viscosity. Okay. And so, in theory, if you could if you could affect the viscosity, then you can also change the Wormersley number as well. Okay, um, that's a little bit hard to do. You know, your blood is kind of at a fixed viscosity. You can't really change it at will. Um, you know, there are situations where the velocity, where the viscosity of your blood decreases when you're going through the smaller capillaries. But for the most part, you know, your your viscosity is relatively constant. Okay, so we're going to assume that's that's fixed. The other thing that changes here is the vessel radius. Right. Now the vessel radius does change throughout the cardiovascular system. And in fact, it depends on where you are. A lot of you are seeing this kind of in a, uh, in, on kind of a hands-on way with your models, right? And so as, you know, you, for most of you, you have kind of a, uh, um, kind of a bigger vessel that kind of anchors your, your model, like the aorta or maybe the, the, the uh, vena cava, right? And then as you kind of branch out, the vessel radius is, is starts to get smaller, right? And we saw this in kind of various parts of the, uh, of the, um, of this class as well, right? So what that means is that your different vessels even if the frequency is the same, right? So even, even if you're at a relatively steady kind of heart rate, you know, you're, the different vessels in your body are going to have different Wormersley numbers. And if they have different Wormersley numbers, that means they have the they have different shapes of their velocity profiles. So some examples, so some of the larger vessels, so like maybe a, a huge vessel like the aorta, okay. Many, many of your project models have the aorta in them. These have Wormersley numbers kind of around, you know, somewhere around 13 to 15.
Okay, so fairly high. And so that means in the aorta, you don't often get parabolic flow just because the vessel was kind of so big, okay? And so maybe some of the smaller vessels, and so you know some of these some of these vessels you know maybe are too small for your, your models. Some of your models may have them, but um, you know small, some of them maybe the small arterioles. Okay, these have much smaller warm as we know. Question. So these may have warm as we number around 0 0.05, just because the radius is a lot small. Okay. Now, of course, these, these numbers can shift, right? So depending on, on your heart rate, depending on how quickly your, your heart is beating, then these uh, numbers can shift. But these are kind of typical numbers for, for people at, at least. All right. And then the way to kind of think about this is that, you know, your, your larger vessels, they just carry a lot more blood just because their they're radius is a lot larger. So they're just naturally going to have a lot more inertia to them. Um, you know, when, when you're trying to move them around with uh, with an oscillating pressure group. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. Good. All right. So what is what does this mean for you guys' projects, right? And so, you know, I I I mentioned this, you know, many times before, but you know, next week we're going to start to get into CFD, right? Okay, so when you're running your simulations, one really important aspect that you have to specify are the boundary conditions. Any simulation requires boundary conditions, whether it be a fluid simulation, a solid mechanic simulation, thermal simulation, you know, you need specified boundary conditions. Okay. One of the boundary conditions that you'll specify on your inlet face is a velocity boundary condition. And so the way you're going to specify this, you're going to specify kind of two things, okay? And so on the one hand, you're going to specify the flow or the flow rate, okay? So remember the flow rate kind of describes the, 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 the exact kind of mass or the, the rate at which the total volume of fluid is going to enter your system, okay? So that's one thing. The other thing that you have to specify or you're going to specify is a velocity distribution. Because it's, it's not enough just to specify the flow. You want to. You also need to specify how that flow is distributed among the velocity. Okay. So let me give you two examples. So let's do kind of a, a very classic kind of parabolic profile like this. And then on the other hand here, I'm going to do what's called a. Um, um, so we, we call it a, a plug profile, which is more like a kind of a flat profile, which kind of looks more like this. So depending on how you specify these velocities, both of these both of these profiles can have the exact same flow rate, right? Because the flow rate is nothing more than just the integral under the curve. And so if the area under these two curves is the same, then they can have the same flow rate, right? But obviously these two results here are going to result is are going to produce um, different simulation results, right? Whereas one, you know, with the with the parabolic velocity profile, you're going to have certain shear stresses on the walls versus on the plug profile, that's going to be something different as well. 
And then for blood flow, and spe specifically um, unsteady blood flow, we can also have a warmer sleep flow. And so warmers we profile will have the ability to kind of form these, these kind of dimmers. Okay. Now, granted, you know, the warmers we profile is only relevant when you have unsteady flow. And so if your simulation is just going to have steady flow, then then it's then you know it, it really doesn't make a difference. A steady warmers we profile is, is basically the same as parabolic. Uh, but that's an important choice that you have to make in terms of how your velocity is going to be distributed at your inlet. Okay, um, and it, and it does it does affect your results. So it, especially a result that may be close to your uh, close to your inlet. And I know some of you have have models within that in that category where you have you know maybe you have a disease or maybe you have a, a problem area that's right next to your inlet. And so how you define the velocity profile is is going to have a big impact on your results. Okay. Okay. So when we do our tutorial next week, you know, there'll be a time when, you know, we're going to choose the, the velocity distribution. That's, this is what it means, right? So you're basically choosing how the velocity is distributed for a fixed flow rate. All right. Any questions on, any questions on this? Okay, cool. All right. So the last thing, uh, the last thing I want to cover today for the last 15 minutes is uh, a little brief review of Fourier series. Right. So actually, Fourier actually has a lot of uh, relevance to um, what we're going to do here as well. This is another setting that you'll do for an unsteady simulation. Okay. So, so far, the solution, the, uh, the warmers lay solution that we have is, is only for a fixed frequency. So we're basically assuming that our oscillation frequency omega is the same. Okay. Now this is particularly relevant because you know one 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 kind of um, implicit assumption that we made through our derivation was that this frequency represents a represents a sinusoidal frequency. And all that basically means is that our forcing function is, is basically sine and cosine. That's what we that's what we said. Okay. We said that e to the i omega t is the same as cosine omega t plus i sine omega t. Okay. All right. So if we had a situation, if we had a uh, if we had a pressure distribution or pressure evolution in our system that perfectly fit a sinusoid. We'd be we'd be Gucci. We'd be we'd be good to go. So let me draw the pressure distribution again, or pressure uh, pressure waveform, right? So remember, we 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 went over this kind of really early in the class, right? So a typical pressure waveform looks something like this: time, pressure. It's it's definitely pulsatile, so it's it's definitely kind of a it it changes with time, but it it doesn't really have a sinusoidal shape, right? And so it looks kind of something like like this. And so we have kind of a thing that comes up. It kind of a little notch, and we have, and then it goes down right, right there. Okay, where we have the systolic, uh, systole where the the heart is contracting, and then diastole when it's relaxed. Okay, now this does repeat, right? And so in the next heart cycle, this is going to come up again, right? But you know, it, you'd be kind of hard pressed to say that this 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 looks like a sinusoid. 
So even though this is a periodic function, You can have a periodic function that doesn't look like a sine or cosine. In fact, you know, there's a lot of functions that look like that, right? Sine and cosine are just the most mathematic convenient periodic functions. Okay. So what does this mean for us, right? So this, does this mean we need to form a whole new solution with a, with a general periodic function? Luckily, no, right? We can make use of Fourier, right? Because if you recall from, from 308, right? Um, one of the things that Fourier series taught us was that any periodic function can be reconstructed using an infinite sum of sinusoids. Basically, basically saying is that you can you can make you can take any periodic function where f of x is is a or say f of t is a periodic function. Okay. And if you took the infinite summation of i is equal to one to infinity, or I think it starts at zero actually. Excuse me, for i is equal to zero um, to infinity of a i. times cosine omega i t plus b i sine omega i t, okay? Or if you prefer um, the one that's a little bit more compact, we can use the Euler's formula. So this is equal to summation n is equal to zero to infinity of a n e to the i omega n t. Okay. That's probably the more common way just because it's uh, um, it's more compact. Okay. So this so this applies for any periodic function. So as long as your function repeats to some to some degree, you can you can reconstruct it as a sum of, of infinite sinusoids. Okay. And so that includes that includes the pressure gradient. Right? Because if you remember, you know, the whole reason we kind of went down this journey of solving the Bessel's functions and, and, and whatnot is because we, we, were, we were assuming that our pressure gradient was oscillating with time, okay? Granted, we found our solution for just a single fixed frequency, but you know, by using uh, by using Fourier series like this, we can use this to basically construct any velocity solution that we want. Okay. So basically, it's like this. It's so you know, and and this is something that's kind of more for your information. This is this is kind of way too mathematically intense to do by hand. Okay. So if your pressure gradient or if you're forcing. And so if your forcing function is comprised of a Fourier series like it is above, okay, then your solution is also going to be a Fourier series using the same Fourier coefficients.
Okay. So ultimately what that means is that we're going to take our solution that we had before and we're just going to stick a summation down front. Okay. okay, so let's see what that looks like. And so this, will, this is kind of the ultimate kind of a, a solution. We have uz of r comma t is equal to summation of n is equal to zero to infinity <clears throat> a sub n divided by i rho omega n is one minus Bessel function i to three halves r square root omega over nu divided by Bessel function i to three halves big R omega over nu times e to the i omega n t. Okay. The, the thing to notice here is that this a n, you know, and, and we've been using that that variable a throughout this entire throughout this entire week, but we haven't really defined what that what that a actually is, right? This a n corresponds to the same Fourier coefficients that you're using uh, to define your force. So these two these two things are the same. But of course, you know, if you're if you're working in um, in the real world, right? You can't really do an infinite summation. You can't just keep summing terms. And so, what's uh, what's practically done most of the time is that instead of an infinite summation, you do a um, you do a, a cutoff. You have a cutoff frequency. Okay? And so, instead of a summation, normally you you put an upper bound on this. Just to keep things practical, just because even with the computer, you can't really do infinite summation. Okay, so so for cardiovascular flow, you know, usually a cutoff frequency of uh, of, of ten Fourier modes is usually more than adequate. Okay. So if you have if you have about ten modes, that captures most uh, most waveforms that you're going to see in the cardiovascular system. Okay. So that's actually a setting too. So um, you know, when, once we once we start start getting into CFD next week, there'll be a part where you know you're you're applying the unsteady boundary conditions. It's going to ask you how many Fourier modes are you going are you going to apply for the solution. You know, that's that's basically what it means there. Okay. All right. Any final questions on this before we wrap it up for the week? Okay. All right. So that's all we got time for. So thank you guys for coming today. Uh, remember to turn in your projects uh, tomorrow. Uh, I'll be working on grading those uh, next week. Um, and so just like I said, so next week we're uh, getting into the uh, kind of more exciting part of the class. I know it's, it's been kind of dry and mathematical lately, but um, you know we will be working on CFD next week. So on Tuesday, we'll introduce just, the, just some core concepts of CFD. Uh, I know some of you are also taking the CFD course, so hopefully I think that will probably be some review. Uh, and then Thursday, we're actually going to do a workshop where we, you know, set up some CFD simulations and some baths for it to get through. Okay. So next week should be fun. All right. So thank you guys for coming this week. I uh, hope, hope you guys have a good weekend. And uh, yeah, see you next week. I, 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 we discussed yesterday. Yeah. I found it too. Okay, good. I barely can see it.
they can they connect to each other yeah one packed up and then split up yeah it might be a little bit fuzzy just because of the uh of the image data this is the, the first one yeah oh, second one here second one right here you want to make all the way up? Um, um, just take it as far as you can. Um, you know, with the image data, you may not be able to follow it all the way. Yeah. And then the third one, I, I, I see the path up here. Yeah. But I don't see the split. It may split up here. Right here. Yeah. That lo that looks like that looks like the the vessel right there. Okay. So. Yeah, up there, and then one goes kind of this way. And yeah. then the other one kind of goes vertically, kind of towards right. Yeah. Right, here? Yeah, right there. Right here. Yeah, right there. Yeah, but it's not. It's not look like the Are you good? See, you can see. You can see. Yeah. I mean, I, it looks like so. There. I mean, there is a vessel that goes this way. Yeah. I mean, there. There's. I mean, that, that that's the vessel that goes to your left arm, basically. Um. So it could be that this person just kind of cut it off early. I think probably what happens is that right after it's split, they kind of just cut it off right there. But in reality, the vessel kind of goes like goes like that. This one has to be all the way up too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they they just cut it off a little bit early. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. What could help? So, so um, one thing that might help you, just because I know the contrast makes it a little bit hard, is that because your 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 images are so dark, you can do this. So this this kind of um, bar on the side right here kind of um, modifies the contrast. So I would I would maybe narrow this a little bit, so you can see now it's a lot easier to kind of see the the, the blood vessels like that. Yeah. So this would be split right here, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you play around with this, it, it makes it a lot easier to kind of see see the yeah. blood vessels like so that. And you can kind of slide this like that. Um I would at least I would at least get the split and then maybe follow this down. It is very clear. Yeah. yeah. And so it kind of seems like it would be a waste to not kind of follow it all the way. But you know, but but what I have I Basically, what I'm grading you on is like I have I have the reference projects for all of these, mm -hmm. um, and so if you have if yours goes further than that, then you don't, um, you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mark you down on your course, but then I'm also I'm only gonna be grading you up to where it is here in the reference in the reference image. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we cut this one and we cut up, cut it up early. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, not, that's why because when I I found it, I saw it, but like because. This one kind of like, I thought it would go straight up. That's why I put it. Oh, uh, I see. Yeah, I think they cut it off kind of right after, right after the split. So there's extra veins. You can kind yeah, of there like, is. Really there's it there's a go. there's a ton of extra veins in, in these models. I just had a quick question. Sure. So, um, I already submitted, but I was like just looking. Just I wanted to like, triple check. Like if I delete something, like I was trying to delete this because I was just the extra one, but you said I didn't need eight, so I just yeah, because I uh -huh. it, and I save it and like I close it. Yeah. Try to like reopen it. It keeps the same, uh, keeps it the same, even though I saved it. Wow. Oh. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's not too big a deal. Uh, I was just like wondering, because I know, I, I don't know if I, if I delete it from the actual files, it, it's going to like corrupt my file. Because, yeah, like it, it shouldn't. It, it, it keeps so, it saves it. It saves, it saves each of these as separate files. So I think, I think maybe, I think probably what it does is that it, it deletes it from from this uh, from this um, thing. But every time you reopen the project, mm -hmm. it looks for it looks for the directory of the files. And I think that file the file was still there because yeah, the that's, the yeah files. that's what I was looking at right now because I already zipped in and submitted. I just I was just sending running by you because I'm like I don't know I was like confused. I didn't want to like delete it. Oh yeah yeah. I mean I would just keep it if you. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't want to yeah. delete it to erupt it. Is it okay because I already have all the files? In it. The model comes out fine. Yeah yeah yeah. I mean I would I mean I wouldn't delete anything. I would just keep it. So. Okay. Right, it's sure. fine. Yeah, I was a little confused. And also, um, submission wise, I put uh, I jumped back there, but um, did you want a PDF picture of it? No, just just the project. Okay, because I'm going to be opening the project and, and kind of you know zooming around. Okay, for sure. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. I got it now. All right. Cool. Okay. Um. Okay. So I. I started out doing, I had different options because I was like trying to find the biggest vessels, okay. but I got stuck because, let's see, I think the first one I did, I did this like, let's see, where is it? This like really chunky one. Okay. But then like when, as it goes further up, it like stops here and I was able to find like a 3D model of all the vessels in the brain yeah and i saw that there are like bigger ones mm -hmm. but they aren't the ones in like the reference so okay. then i did um uh -oh. i kind of went down to these like small let's see 
this smaller one yeah. that kind of goes up and then then I was like oh my god good I found it yeah but then okay. in the reference there's um a place where like both sides connect and the only place I found where they connect was right here yeah so I'm just a little bit confused if, if I am supposed to do that one because that's what I did um here I ended up doing uh oh goodness let me close this out that's I ended up doing these smaller ones because that's where I haven't done where it branches out yet. But that's um, the only place where I saw where they connect. But the only thing is that these vessels are like really, really small. They are small. So I don't know if because the reference model, they're a little bit bigger. So I don't know if these are the correct ones. Do you have do you have the reference model that you can pull? So they I mean they are supposed to connect. So that's 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 one thing about cerebral vessels that they there's there's a portion of the brain where the blood actually goes in a circle. It's called the circle of wounds. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of this part right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it is supposed to be those like small ones. Like once I did the model, I, I didn't do the model very well because I was trying to just like see what it looked like. Mm -hmm. That's what that like test one model is. But it was just a lot smaller than all the other ones I was looking at, so I just didn't know if I was. I was so confident that I was on the right track, and I was like, "These are really small vessels." I mean, they should be pretty small. Okay. Um, I think what you have is 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 good. I mean, these are these are the two main the mm -hmm. two main vessels that come up to your brain, kind of on the left, and basically they're kind of right under your ear. Okay. And then they come up and they do meet. So the fact that you're able to find the part where they meet up, so that that tells me you're on the right track. So okay. This is the right. This is the right. Those are the right vessels for sure. Okay. So it's not supposed to be those like other two like chunky these, ones. These two, you mean? Yeah, because there's those ones, and then there's like the either. Yeah, the ones that kind of go up to the side. No, 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 not those ones. Okay. Yeah, you know you're on the right track. I think I think they, it only looks bigger here. I think it only looks bigger because when you compare it to these ones up here, they they look bigger. Okay. Um. But I mean, compared compared to all our other models, these are going to be much smaller. Okay. Now, for this one, oh, is this the exact one that you're doing, or is this um, because this is this is just the the project specs, right? But I think in your in your Dropbox folder, there should have been a PDF in there in there as well. Right? Yeah, I looked at the PDF, and there were a bunch of other models, so I knew that it wasn't supposed to like look exactly like. That. Okay, this is just the reference. That was just yeah. Okay. I don't have the Dropbox on it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I, th I think this is fine. I mean, the what I'm looking for, so this is so this is the circle of Lewis right here. Okay. So like when it comes up and it kind of forms this kind of like closed loop circuit, which is very which is very strange actually. So the fact that you found you these vessels actually do meet is is a good sign. So that's that those those are the exact vessels that that you um, that you want. Okay. Not not the other ones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now you're on the right track. And, and then I think those vessels will eventually come up and connect here. So you can see how how much smaller these ones are compared to the one that you're looking at. Okay. So these so these much smaller vessels will be kind of the ones here. So once you do these ones, it's gonna make the one in the bottom look bigger. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. And then we need eight branching vessels. Yes. Okay. Yes. So would that be like these two count as two separate ones? They count as two. So okay. I, I'm looking for eight eight paths. Eight paths, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I realized I kind of got in the rhythm with it like later and I added these I, I really thanked myself because I added these little reference points. Yeah. And I kind of just that's where I found the like um like this little crossing part. Yeah. And then so when I was like doing this, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm on the right thing. Nice. And then I'll just delete that on. Okay. Yeah. No, that's but, good. Yeah. And no, then, it's, it's 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 the cerebro is a challenging one just because it, it, it goes in so many different directions. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Works. When I picked it I was like, I want to challenge myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was kind of funny. And because we do have to write a report, right? We do. Okay, yeah. So that's why I was like, I think this is the most interesting one. It is. Yeah. So I was like, I will I will go through this just to do the A lot of the aorta ones actually are the, the ones that the other people are working are completely healthy. And so they'll have like almost yeah. nothing to write about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh but yeah, no, it'll be it'll be a really good model once 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 it's done. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I was, I was doubting myself. <laughs> <laughs>